welcome everyone uh, to another GaleCon chat. Uh, this one is going to be primarily about how all of us took what was essentially a hobby and have made it into our livelihoods or careers. Uh, I'll be chairing this. My name's Rob. I'm the boring one because I took just messing with computers and then made it into an IT business. Uh, we have Gav Dunn, aka Miracle of Sound, who took making music and into making a hell of a lot of music and is technically the most successful indie artist in Ireland, I believe, by last count. Don't with more like views that. on YouTube than you too. <laughs> no, I don't have more views on YouTube than you too. <laughs> oh, they overtook you? Bleh, they don't deserve or, it. Mm, at one point, there were more monthly views than you too. But, uh... Uh -huh. We have Gareth Hanrahan, who has took writing stories uh, and games to writing stories and games professionally, including the Dracula dossier, which I need to get my hands on. Forgive me, everyone. <laughs> Fly. I was going to do Cat next, but after that, Steve Jackson, killer of flies. <laughs> also, ma also maker of GURPS and Munchkin. Maker of games. Yes, maker hello, of everybody. Well... And last but not least, we have Cat, who took making games and, like Steve, now makes them professionally for a living, is co-owner and co-founder, correct me if I'm wrong, of Pelgrane Press. Um, so I'm the co-owner and managing director. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. And also winner of multiple awards for gaming in Ireland. <laughs> that's, a, that's a very contentious topic. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah. So, so, yeah. But yeah, uh, there have been some, some awards. Someone. There are some pictures of me, you know, over, overburdened with awards. So that's always nice <laughs> when you can't hold them off. You so. actually get physical awards. That's nice. Mm. Yeah, Those the Ennies. Style over out, here, I think. The, the Ennies tend to give out kind of little plaques. So uh, we got something like a dozen of them for the Dracula dossier. And for some reason, ah. I ended up carrying them all. So. Ah. Oh. There may be something at the charity auction of interest from Pelgrane Press and Guard. Yeah. Oh, Marvelous. Well, we can we can talk about that a little towards the end of it. So, who wants to start off? Who wants to say when did you make the leap from hobby and spare time to I now make a living from this? Well, I I will conflict the expectations. I had an intermediate phase. Mm -hmm. um, I was in law school because I thought I wanted to be a lawyer. I learned better, but that was that my important takeaway from law school was that I did not want to be an attorney. But my second takeaway was that contracts and legislation class were very, very interesting because I was writing rules. <laughs> And uh, I was already a gamer, and in contracts and legislation, I found uh, a, a love for frameworks, and sometimes, uh, sometimes the contracts and legislations that you see out there aren't that good, but all the more reason to make them better, all the more reason for a course. So with with that under my belt, in my last year of law school, I was casting about desperately for something to do that wasn't law school. Um, I answered a classified advertisement. It turned out to be from Metagaming. They were looking for an editor for a zine. Now, that was a magic word back then. The zine was not, uh, not anything like a popularly known word. It wasn't even a general geek word. It was a secret science fiction geek word. So I knew that even though there was nothing overt in that ad, I was being invited to join a science fiction operation. I jumped at it. It turned out to be metagaming. I didn't get the job. I was overqualified because I played games. So instead, they put me to work developing games. And this continued for a while as a, a second backup job and hobby and interest 
before I made the jump into, no, I'm doing this on my own and for real. So I had an apprenticeship period. So who, wants to t who wants to take the ball and run with it next? Uh, Rob, yeah. Rob, you you pick. <laughs> I'm not picking. I was jumping in there. Yeah, I, I actually Go for it, Gar. Yeah, I mean, actually, my idea is faintly similar to Stephen's sort of like general contours. Um, I did computer science in college with the like big long term plan of like you know getting a real job in computing and then a little bit of writing on the side. And I graduated college and turned writing stories for cons into doing some freelance work for um, like fantasy fight games and people. And this is around the same time that T20 was booming. So there was lots of little bits of freelancing to go. So it was like, you know, doing a little bit for various companies. And then the computer game job, computer, computer game job, the insanely boring real world computer job I had went away with the company downsized. And I sort of looked at my rent, looked at my savings, and went, well, I'll, I'll, I've got like, you know, three or four months that I can, you know, survive without having to, like, you know, go, go home and crash my parents. Um, I'll try freelancing for a bit before I look for a real job again, because I wasn't really enjoying the computer job. And I kept freelancing, and then that turned into a not especially well-planned full-time job. And then I got a actual permanent position with Mogus Publishing for a while. And that rolled into... More contracts and she ended up where I am now at Pellegrin. It was absolutely unplanned and more so sort of pushed out into, the, into, into turning hobby into job as opposed to doing it deliberately. So I'll I'll pick up from there then. Um, just kind of keeping on the on the RPG gaming um, trend. So my um, so it's it's kind of. It, it's always been obvious to me how if you wanted to write, like, for example, Gar was was writing for RPG companies and I was just, I knew I wasn't a writer, but I've always been an organiser, right? So I come out of, um, I was very involved with Warps back in the day, like Gareth, and um, I used to, I ran WarpCon and I co-founded K2, which is a residential a convention in, I think it's now in Waterford, um, but it started off being in Kerry. So I, I'd always been involved on the organizational side, on the, the making things happen side. Um, and I moved to Edinburgh and I got a job in financial, in finance, basically in accounting and financial services. And I was, I was just really, really miserable at it. And um, yeah, and, and I kept trying to apply for different jobs within the same organization, maybe more project managing ones. And I'd go for all these interviews. And every time I would go for an interview, um, people would say, well, you know, maybe you're qualified for this. But whatever this gaming thing is, when you talk about that, your eyes just light up. It's really clear that that's your passion. And I'm like, yeah, I know, but there's no jobs in it, Ted. So like... <laughs> Just, <laughs> you'll give me money, gaming won't, so like, let's just do that. Um, so that kind of continued on for a while. And then actually my dad had a heart attack in 2011. And I kind of looked at where I was in Edinburgh and I went, look, you know what? People have been saying this to me for years. I had always been everywhere I went, I've moved around a lot. And everywhere I'd gone, I'd connected in with the local RPG community. And I'd gotten involved in the, in, organizing things like I was involved in, in running compulsion in Edinburgh as well and I'd always just done that um, and I went you know what Lo, I'm just gonna like uh, I'm gonna make that leap so I decided to move back to Cork and um, I said you know what I'm gonna starve in a garage right I'm just gonna starve to death but I'm gonna work in games right? that's I am I am making myself that pledge right now I'm gonna do that and my plan was to set up my own games company and I was going to do like mobile games and ARGs and that kind of thing um, and when after I moved back to Cork I got involved in running Dragon Meet in which is a big convention in London um, and I was involved in that for a couple of years but while I was there I met Simon Rogers who's um, the co-owner and co-founder of, of Elgrain Press um, and he kind of said to me oh I, I've always wanted to do an Elgrain convention and I was like <laughs> cool well hit me up uh, if you want to do that and you know I can run it for you um, and a couple of months later he reached out to me and he said hey have you got a CV that you could send me and I was like sure so I sent him through this event management CV 
uh, of all the kind of convention work I'd done. And he said, well, do you have any other skills? And I was like, uh, yeah, but like, can you, feels like you're rooting around for something here. And he went, well, I have this job and I wondered if you'd be interested in it. And I was like, and basically it was, um, it was a production editor job and it was the job I had been looking for in gaming for the past 20 years. And I was like, <laughs> score. Um, and I, I, I spent, I literally spent eight hours on my cover letter and I spent about two days on my CV for my application for this job. I was like, this, this is my job. This is, this is my job. Like it, this cannot be anyone else's job. And I did an interview and I dressed up in a suit and, um, Pelgrane was sharing an office with James Wallace at the time and I knew James quite well and I walked in in my suit and James laughed at me and I was like, James, I'm taking this really seriously. This is like, you know, this could be game changing for me. And anyway, TLDR, I got the job and um, apparently in my interview, when Simon asked me where I saw myself in five years, I said running your company. Um, now, I don't remember that and I argue that, but that's what he says. Um, and yeah, so I slowly started seizing more and more control until um until basically i started running it so that's that's right but like there's you know a whole 20 years of, of volunteer work in in the gaming industry behind me in in every sort of capacity in terms of running conventions i used to do accounts for a gaming company um i wrote little bits and pieces here and there and just i've just done everything well, as a hobby, we need more organizers because there are so many people out there with the wonderful talents who can't uh, tell the hay foot from the straw foot when it comes down to actually making a thing happen. So thank you. <laughs> but that is the thing. Like, um, I think that in the RPG industry, we, all, we know that we need writers. We know that we need um, game designers, game developers, and artists. But we, we never think of, you know, the person that's standing there in the middle, taking the thing from the writer, giving it to the layout person, taking the art from the artist, giving that to the layout person, and then getting all of the components to the printers. And that's that's kind of me. That's what I do. Yes, you need the matrix that holds things together. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and Gab, your turn, unless you want me to go next. I'm boring. You go next. Um, well, it's a funny one for me. Can you hear me okay, by the way? I don't know if my mic Fine. volume is... Um, because I've never considered music a hobby. It's always been from the moment I picked up a guitar age 15 in 1995, that was it. There was never going to be anything else for me but music. Um, it's the gaming nerdy side of stuff that kind of brings the hobbyism in for me. But um, I just started, like most musicians, playing in bands. I played in bands for nearly 15, 15 16 years before Miracle of Sound happened. So I had a lot of experience. Um, I did a lot of music for theatre when I was growing up. My mother ran a theatre company, so I would do the soundtracks for the plays. That was probably really helpful for what I do now in the kind of different genres and getting things to fit with stuff. Um, I was in a band called Lotus Lullaby for 10 years or so. We won Murphy's Live, we won the, music, the Student Music Award. And uh, it was the classical cliche of as soon as we got a record deal, the band kind of fell apart. and there was tension and as the kind of head songwriter the company kind of was only interested in me um because i've never been very good at uh playing instruments um my hands are very clumsy i don't deserve this beautiful les paul right here <laughs> and uh, uh, so he's... i always focused on my strengths which were with writing and creating moods and producing uh interesting songs and when that band fell apart, I was feeling a little sorry for myself and a little depressed. And I wrote a stupid song about Gordon Freeman to cheer myself up. And uh, I put it on the internet and it kind of blew up a little. So then I made another couple and it was when I made the Commander Shepherd song that people really started to listen. And I had a nice audience then for a couple of years and then The Witcher 3 happened. <laughs> and Wake the White Wolf came out and then the career just exploded and that was when i knew this was going to be a forever thing was when wake the white wolf happened so does that <laughs> sum it up okay <laughs> yeah and for me i've been tinkering with computers most of my life eight years ago nine years ago i was made redundant 
from after working for Blizzard, working for Goa Mythic EA, and then working for an ISP. I was made redundant from that. I was like, I need money. I need to support my family. I'm pretty okay with tech. I formed my own IT company, and it's been running for eight years successfully, helping schools and charities in Ireland not get ripped off. And that's what I still do. So, yeah. <laughs> but I've always messed with tech. For me, it was never a hobby. Uh, like with Gav, it was like from the first day I got my first computer when I was six, seven, and took it apart. My parents lost the plot. <laughs> I wanted to see how it worked. I put it back together. It still worked. What was the problem? And now, well, in my office here at home, I have a 42U server rack here that runs uh, Skynet, essentially. <laughs> <laughs> I go to Rob whenever I have a, a computer problem. <laughs> Full disclosure. Rob, why, I why does my laptop not know that there's a camera in it and why, why can't it find it? <laughs> we were doing that with, with one of the other co committee members today. Her, We, we don't know why. Uh, um, well, it's funny that Kat mentioned Windows updates because A, they're psychic and they know when it's the, the worst possible time, but they also just break your shit. Yep. It was a Windows update, I think, although it is coincidence that I lent the laptop to my wife for the first time ever that day as well. But she claims it's not anything. Oh, to do don't with blame her, Rachel. So I'm going to blame the Windows update. <laughs> Gavin, I, I actually help Gav on his Patreon Discord. It's how we know each other pretty well at this point. But we were introduced by a mutual friend. Just, just so people are aware, Gavin, I do have a little bit of a history. Um, so. Now, now we've all introduced ourselves, and so now it's going to the point where we're like, if someone was to come to any of us and kind of say, I like doing X, where do I go from here? What would it sort of, like, if you could kind of, what sort of advice and suggestions would you give them if they wanted to go forward? Bearing in mind that none of us are career advisors, counselors at all. Take what we say with a couple of pints of salt. I think... Um... Sorry, will I go first here? Or? Okay, yeah, yeah, the floor is open. Go crazy. I, I, I always think the most important thing people don't realize is how okay it is to fail multiple times and how it's all part of the process. And 99% of the time, you're not going to be successful straight away. And sometimes it takes, like in my case, decades. And uh, really, I think as much as talent and anything like that is somewhat important for careers i think dedication and resilience are just as important i see, I see the ability to now. take the ability to take a lot of knocks and not be deterred yeah definitely i mean with any with any sort of creative career there are always be lots of other people who are like just as creative and just as like you know have just as much as talent as you do so to make career lovers, you need to be, be like so get, get, get lucky breaks, and often that means create opportunities for those breaks to happen. Um, yeah, I mean, certainly with with me, um, there are like uh, three or four sort of branch points I can see where I wouldn't be able to continue freelancing and writing as as, as a career if things like you know things have gone even slightly differently. Um, so yeah, luck, luck is a huge thing, and also by sort of being willing to um, accept the, you know, that it is a inherently unstable and risky career path. <laughs> that there, there is no you know, sort of like shape your own career. There's no like you know clear hierarchy of like you know like in this position five years, this position ten. There's no corporate structure really. That's really e even the most talented people as well need to put in thousands of hours of work. To get good yeah just kind of picking up on, on what gar said there like i think particularly in in rpgs like there there absolutely is no career path like i said like i spent 20 years trying to find this this one job um and it was the only opportunity like this that i saw in those 20 years um like it's but the, the i think that the key thing is having clarity around what it is you want and why it is you want that, right? So like, if, for example, if you want to write RPGs, great. Why do you want to, to do that? Like do, genuinely, are you interested in the fame and the glory or do you just love to write 
RPGs, right? Because the thing is, if you just love to write RPGs, then you need to be publicly writing RPGs. You need to have a blog or, you know, Facebook page or even a website or something, and you need to have your writing out there, right? Um, the industry is very small. We talked about this a bit yesterday. Um, and most people know most people in it as well. Like, and we can see this in the Irish RPG industry in particular. Like, a lot of people, you know, all the kind of Gelcon people and the kind of work WorkCon people, we all know each other. Um, so there's a lot of, like Gar said, the luck, but also there is making sure that you have established yourself as the right person for the opportunities that you're looking for when that lucky break happens. Because if a lucky break comes up, right, for for example, like writing RPGs, and you aren't able, like Gar was, to like point to your back catalogue of extensively writing convention adventures, you know, and, and writing bits and pieces for other companies, then, you know, all the luck in the world won't get you that job. You know, you need to just put in the errors. And there's a big, um, I guess a big tension in the industry as well between a lot of people will tell you, and, and this is true, I think in a lot of creative industries that you should never work for free, right? You know, they say your work, your work is worth something, you know, you should never work for anyone for free. And, and I, do, I do agree with that. And that is true. You should never, if somebody commissions you to do a thing, you should always get some kind of payment for that. But equally, if you're a creative person in a creative industry, you have to be able to demonstrate what you can do to any prospective employer. And the only way you can do that when you don't already have a prospective employer is to effectively work for free and build up a, a portfolio, build up a CV that you can then present to employers. So yeah, like again, PLD or like Gar said, you, you have to create your own career path. And that means being very single-minded and very focused about where it is you're going and, and what it is you want to do, like, yes. you know. We are slowly uh, interviewing a new possible editor for fantasy trip material. And uh, he became known to me uh, from a fan discord. And uh, he obviously wrote, if somewhat at length when he wrote, it was still clear and uh, coherent. And... Uh, he eventually expressed interest in a, a real position. And I said, I'm not saying no. And the first thing that he did for us was for free because I sent him about a 500 word article and I said, how would you edit this? And he said, I'd send it back. And <laughs> so he passed the first test. <laughs> and he, didn't, he didn't try to put a shine on something that can't be shown. And I sent him another one, and he did a very good job on it. I think I added one Oxford comma or something like that. So now I will send him a manuscript in the neighborhood of 60 or 70,000 words and pay him for that. Just pay him standard editing rates, and we'll see how it goes. I think that's hugely but, uh, undervalued in the creative world. It's just basic social and communication skills. <laughs> I'm amazed how many people get in touch with me and are just really obnoxious about how they go about it and don't mm -hmm. take the time to write properly or, or say hi or please or thank you or any kind of social norms. And I don't know if the social media age did that or if it was always like that, but being, mm. being respectful and polite gets you a long way in life as does having good communication skills. I mean, I've always said that the single most important skill for any freelancer, when I was like, you know, commissioning freelancers for work, when I was a line manager for various companies, was not like, you know, your writing had, had to be good, but like, you know, what really made my, my heart to see with a freelancer was someone who would answer emails promptly and say, I'm going to be late with this particular assignment, or it'll be in on time, or I'm running into trouble, can I have some help? Because when you're on the other side of the, um, on the writing thing when like you're, you're getting work for other people and it's going to book nothing ruins your life more than stuff not appearing or stuff appearing like past the deadline and it's terribly good to like you know suddenly write it so like communication like yeah learning learn to communicate is a huge way to sell yourself as a respective freelancer yeah and, and as a person who hires freelancers as well like honestly the you would not believe the the priority um that we put on um, 
timeliness and good communications, right? Like you can be the best writer in the world, but if you can't get your stuff done on time, <laughs> um, <laughs> mentioning no names, um, then, you know, it, it's just not going to work, right? You have to be able to deliver to deadlines. You know, we have a production schedule. We have, we have to release things at a particular time, you know, our community get excited about things and we don't want to be going back to them saying, uh, sorry, yeah, we just don't really know where this is, you know? So honestly, like, you know, you can, you can get very, very far being like mediumly talented, but very, very good at communications and, and time management. That's true. Uh, works the other way as well. Uh, you can, if you're, if you're very, very good and very, very precise, you don't have to communicate much except here is article is on time. Uh, but if there are any problems or questions, you had better be able to cultivate a relationship with the, with your supervisor. Um, we have a situation going on right now with a very good freelancer who is um, more than a month late for medical reasons. But uh, he has communicated uh, well since day one of the problem. And the response, of course, was take the time you need to heal. We have, uh, we have several things in the pipeline. The one we're working with here hasn't even been announced yet. Um, so it'll come out a bit later. But you take care of you. And it's a luxury to be able to say that. I would not have liked to say, oh, my God, you have to send us something by October 31st. I have been fortunate that with, as Mike, once I've got myself set up on a few occasions, like I, I can't get out. Something has happened. And like this is a school. They're relying on the stuff to be built, built uh, and running. And you're like, I'm sorry, this has happened. And thankfully, I'm clear as you said clear communication great way to get people never to work with you again is to tell them something will be done then the date it was meant to be done goes past and you don't contact them to tell them anything about the reason it wasn't done right this this is something that in the music yeah. world is just fucking this is why i work alone 99% <laughs> of the time I work alone because oh my god musicians are especially flaky <laughs> I, I, don't, I don't know if you've worked with many RPG writers but uh, yeah no. I think we could have a bit of a competition there <laughs> I've worked with some, some video game writers alright but uh... there's another way to, uh, to get yourself taken off lists and that's on deadline to send in something that's too long by half and requires heavy, heavy editing. Mm -hmm. Often I have found out the hard way that I didn't need this writer, but if I could only hire the editor that <laughs> they had had at their last job, I would be better off. Also a very important thing to remember is if you want to work with someone and you're emailing them, make sure to link your project in the email. Don't make them message you back saying, can you link the work so I can make a decision? Oh, yes. Sorry, I sound very cynical here. <laughs> no. No, no not this at all. This is the reality <laughs> check for people getting this into is, the business. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. This is the reality yeah. of how, how the world works. How it actually works, yeah. I mean, once once your hobby becomes your job, then it has to be treated as a job. I mean, I love sort of the casualness of the gaming industry. Like, you know, I can work like whatever hours I want. Cat doesn't care if I'm like, you know, uh, typing at like three in the morning or whatever. Um, I can like, you know, if um, I got to take care of the kids um, during the day now and I've moved my pelican hours to the evenings. If I like, yeah, want to take a week off and make up that work the following week, there'd be no problem with that. It, it is all very, very handy. I can work from home. The thing I cannot mention without paying a charity. No, I've got that covered. Don't worry. <laughs> well, the uh, joke that I made is on the that. company, I can work whatever hours I want in a week as long as there are at least 60 of them. <laughs> As the owner of a company, I can set whatever hours I want. 
the problem is if I don't work any hours, we don't eat. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That is yeah. the flip side of it. But like, you know, the flexibility is lovely. Mm. My resolution yeah, but... for 2020 was to work a few hours. And it's been lovely. <laughs> <laughs> And the, the flexibility is fantastic, but it does, you know, with great loveliness comes great responsibility to then manage your own time and make sure that you are, you know, setting aside that time to actually get the work done. And, you know, um, I suspect that, that we all work from home and there's a whole other um, aspect to that, you know, of working remotely. Like Algrain is a distributed company, you know, Gar's in Cork, I'm in West Cork, Simon's in London, Ken is in Chicago, and Robin's in Toronto. So, like, we are kind of all over the world, and then our freelancers are, are even more varied. Um, and, and that brings its own challenges, right? Because it's, you know, you that's, and again, it comes back to that communication thing. It's, it's like, you know, I am not sitting there like looking over Gar's shoulder every day, kind of going, show me, show me what you've done. But equally, that trust that I extend to him needs to be repaid in results. Right. You know, I, we I can. Were, no, we were not a distributed company until the plague hit. We very quickly learned and we are now distributed and dealing with some of the things that that brings. It's, it's a very, very different working situation. It do, you, really do, you folks, do you folks find that you're never not working, even when you're not? <laughs> yeah. Not, it, never, it, never shuts, it never really shuts off, even when you're taking time off. <laughs> if, I, if I can concentrate on Lego, then I'm not thinking about yeah. work, and that's one of the good things about the Lego. Yeah. yeah. If I'm, well, I'm always thinking of work, because if I'm not, work working and for my clients and stuff i tend to have discord open so i tend to have gaz discord open uh, i tend to have another streamer mr greggles open because i'm admin to both of those um and i could be tech questions like uh, one of them Mr. Greggles, he's actually built out his back a fully soundproofed studio with two separate soundproofed rooms air conditioning he's been Sweet. it and i've been helping him with some of the Stuff. Hey, 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 we'll work on yours next, Gav. I promise. We're using <laughs> we're using Greg as the test bench. Anything that goes wrong, we'll learn from. <laughs> but I'm always working with tech um, or teaching my daughter. We built her first PC recently. She's only eight, but we built her. Ooh, PC. Nice. very good. Um, well, it was sensible that during the lockdown here in Ireland when the schools were not open for March. It was like sensible time to do it. Yeah, I remember. Add that one to the list. I mentioned lockdown twice. <laughs> um, but yeah. I'm always I'm always thinking of the tech that can be used in schools and in charities. How can it be done? And my primary concern is how can it be done without ripping the schools off? Because yes. there's companies here in Ireland that will charge five to six times the cost. And that's the problem. Mm. But as I said... I'm always thinking of this, even when I'm sitting at dinner with my family and stuff, and we're talking about something completely different. But, like, my daughter will mention something that will happen in school about tech, and it'll make me think. And the only yeah, time I'm not really thinking is if I'm playing a game or listening yeah, to music exactly. or Video building Lego. Or, yeah. I'm, I mean, I'm terrible. I'm wake, I'd be waking my wife up at three in the morning because I'm singing ideas into my phone. <laughs> <laughs> I finally have that chorus. I've been like, I don't know if you guys find this as well, but for me in, in creative areas, it's always, uh, you can struggle for like weeks to come up with an idea, a particular idea. And then it's like, you're trying to sleep at three o'clock in the morning. And that's when the idea will inconveniently arrive in your head. <laughs> Yeah, it, it's it's funny because when I was when I worked in the finance, when I was an accountant, I never went home in the evening and thought about spreadsheets. You know, I never thought, gosh, you know, what if we could do this with a balance sheet? You know, it's, yeah. it's not really how it works. <laughs> but like gaming is so different because, again, it's having made my hobby, my job, all of my friends are gamers. Right. So a lot of the conversations that I have with my friends are about gaming, which which inevitably all percolates through to the kind of work that I'm doing. Um, and as well as that, because again, because, you know, role playing is so small or whatever, like we're all on social media. So you have to be kind of connected 24 seven. Like there's, you know, the majority of the chat in the industry 
um, is in the US and Canada. So, you know, they're on different hours to us. And, you know, it's there's kind of a, a 24 seven news cycle for RPGs, for gaming, for what's happening, you know, and you have to kind of stay on top of that. Um, and also you become very accessible to people as well. Like, and I think this is particularly true of, of RPGs. Like I was having a conversation with somebody recently and they were saying, oh, you know, um, you can't just like DM Bill Gates, right? You can't just like Twitter DM him, right? And if you do, you know, he's got people that would answer it. But like, I don't have people who answer my Facebook messages or my or my Twitter messages. And, and people, you know, people message me all the time on those kind of saying, oh, hey, I've got this Pelgrane issue. And I'm like, cool. All right. You know, that I don't to, suppose you yeah. can you know, that that to me is support. the the biggest double edged sword of this yeah, kind of it work. Is. It's it's both you know, wonderful it, and and horrific. <laughs> it absolutely is because on the one hand you're really like like I said when I when I was an accountant, nobody knew what I did, nobody cared what I did. But now it's like there is this whole community that has a kind of a and we're like really lucky at Pelgrim and that our community are fantastic. Like they're such great great people. Um, so they're very respectful in a way that I've seen other um, other RPG companies communities not be so much. Um, but yeah, there, but there's still that kind of that kind of friendliness, you know, that kind of parasocial relationship I touched on yesterday um, going on with people feeling like you're available to them. Um, and it's great, and you are, and you want to be, but also I don't. you gotta speak. <laughs> you know, I've gotta speak I've tried. Age. I've always said on Twitter, don't cultivate that with me. I'm not your friend. I make a thing you like, you enjoy the thing I like. That's awesome. But and, and that's a key we, part we, of that's the as whole far as it goes. Your hobby, your job <laughs> thing. I think it's doubly true in gaming because it's more of a two way thing. Like with music, you put it out there and they appreciate it. And they basically they give you feedback and they give a pop they like for it. But it's fun. With gaming, you would think like, you know, oh, I really like this book, but like, you know, my players uh, really don't like fights. How can I adapt this adventure to downplay the combat? Or um, I have this cool idea for an addition to this war game. What do you think of these rules? There's, there's oh, way more... Music fans have a lot of suggestions too, trust me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's, uh, I think the nature of gaming is that you don't give people a finished product. You give people mm. a framework or a structure to build their own games on. And so as a result, it's a lot more, it's just a really, really collaborative hobby, which is fantastic because you get that really strong sense of community from it. But also it does mean that you're, you know, you're right there in there with everyone else. Can I jump all over that with disagreements just for fun? <laughs> of course you can. Yes. Uh, I'm, I'm concerned about the statement, we're not trying to deliver a finished product. Uh, I, I know how you meant it, but it can also be taken in ways that are all too descriptive in some of the things that are out there. And uh, we should always strive to deliver a finished product, knowing that, of course, it, in one sense, it's never really finished because every user group will bring their own, their own spin to it. Art, never's, art is never finished. It just stops in interesting places. At some right. point, you just have to let it go. <laughs> yep. Yeah. I mean, the, the thing, yeah, the, that wasn't entirely what I meant, obviously. I, mm. I was kind of more saying that we give people, like, an RPG is by its nature not the complete experience that gamers have at the table with it because every group puts their own spin on it. So, and yeah, they, so it wasn't they, so much a, a fit. Obviously, we, you know, you're always, you should always be aiming to, to produce the I don't I don't know much about role playing games cap but I would presume that they rely a lot more on the audience's creative input than something yeah. like even Absolutely. video games or music Absolutely. or tv yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. because the, the thing is I guess if you're watching a tv show or a film or listening to music mm -hmm. you know you can kind of think oh yeah it would be cool if it was like this but but you not. can't directly <laughs> change it whereas yeah. with an RPG you can take an RPG at your table and if you think, oh, it would be better to have it like this, then you can just change it. You can do, you can literally directly impact the way you consume that medium um, in a way that you can't really with other media. The thing that chaps me is when someone who has very good ideas 
is not getting or is not taking the kind of feedback that would let the ideas be tied together. And this makes material that may be fun to read, but is hard, hard to use to create your own experience. Yeah, I think that's another key part about the making your hobby your job is that typically that means that it's a thing you've been doing for a long time and believe that you have a lot of experience in. And so, yeah, often you see that kind of disconnect when people who have been gaming and possibly even writing adventures or writing their own games for years and years come to a company and kind of say, oh, yeah, well, I'm obviously I'm done. And it's like, no, not, not really. This yes, I have, to, to, I have to deal with a couple of those who so desperately want to be published, but they are still stuck in the ones that they're doing for their group who knows them. Um, if any, if anyone does mind, will we open the floor to some questions from chat, see if they have anything that they'd like yeah. to ask the group yeah, or directly. Okay. okay, so those of us watching, um, please feel free to ask in chat. Our <laughs> wonderful staff will curate the questions. Um, how much do we want to do we want to keep it on topic or if someone has an interest just a general question or an interesting question or even just a fun one i'd uh, i'd be free this is an irish convention <laughs> <laughs> right let's open the floor uh, just keep it polite is all i'd ask so let's right. see what starts flowing through while we're waiting for the first couple of questions uh, i do just want to say thank you all and while we're waiting for them how about you all plug your stuff free advertising go for it um, well, yeah, so seeing as we're, we're here at Gelcon, we've got um, our Pelgrane Press uh, channel in the trade hall on the Gelcon Discord. Um, but the big thing I want to plug at the moment is that we're um, our, our Dracula dossier collection, um, which, you know, spoiler, is going to be in the um, part of the auction tonight. Thank you, Gareth. Um, is um, is currently available in the bundle of holding. So you can get like the entire Dracula dossier collection for something like 30 US dollars, which is just, if, if you've ever been even vaguely interested, it, it's a fantastic way of getting that whole collection really, really deeply. Um, and yeah, but pilgrimpress.com, all of our latest um, releases are up there. We're currently working on a really exciting sword and sorcery game called Swords of the Serpentine. And that's using our gumshoe system, which is kind of an investigative mystery solving system. And that's going to be really good fun. It's kind of got like hints of like Blank Mar and, and more pop than on that kind of medieval city rife with politics and corruption kind of feel to it. So we're really excited about that. Okay. Next. Okay. <laughs> Two short words. Car wars. Yes. <laughs> I love car wars. It won't be long now. Yes. <clears throat> right. <laughs> Excuse me. Be right back. Pre-ordering. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, if you're going to pre-order something, pre-order the brand new little supplement to Illuminati. We did Illuminati 2020. It's, I think, 24 or 26 cards. And it's not quite as funny as some of the previous ones because <laughs> I was writing it from a, a position of fear and pain and sorrow and fright because I live in 2020 now. <laughs> That's a fine... <laughs> <laughs> no, I got it covered. As the host, I have to pay it. It's great. I'm just putting a hundred quid into the charity bucket for all of you. Um, Kat's covered the, uh, my, the sort of pedigree side of things, so I shall plug my novels. Because once you turn one hobby into a job, why not turn the other, another hobby into a job? Um, yeah, but uh, two parts of novels: The Shadow Saint and The Prayer, out from Orbit Books. And number three is on the way in May of next year. Gav? Uh, my music is on the internet under the name Miracle of Sound. And you can find it on YouTube, on Spotify, iTunes, all those places. And a lot of us is inspired by video games and stuff like that. Um, but it's interesting. We're doing a, an Irish con this weekend because I just released an eight and a half minute folk metal anthem about Coo Cullen this week so and it was my first time teaming up with Irish trad musicians so it was a lot of fun and it's getting a great response so for the Irish people in the <laughs> in the audience I'd recommend checking that one out cool so we do have a couple of questions that have come through and 
considering that the charity this year is for belong to etc this is going to be a heavy hitter for cat is there much misogyny in the business <laughs> Um, yeah, that's a good question. Thank you, Seamus. Um, I mean, I, look, it's much, 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 much better, um, which is to say yes, comma, but. Um, I mean, I think that we've all gotten a lot better at understanding. I think we've all, we've all become better educated in terms of what misogyny is, and we're now a lot more aware of the difficulties that um, people of colour and and women and other um, underrepresented groups face in, in society and as a result in also in gaming society. And we've gotten a lot better at um, foregrounding women and we've gotten a lot better at, um, you know, at, at making space for people who are not cis and white dudes in our industry. Um, we still have a long, long way to go and there is, there is still a lot of what I would kind of consider um, kind of um, unconscious or inconspicuous misogyny. So, you know, you, there are a lot of internet trolls out there, don't get me wrong. I've been, um, been referred to, um, I've personally been said that um, I've ruined Pelgrane, obviously, but they haven't called me by name. They've said the female person in charge of Pelgrane has ruined Pelgrane. So, I, I like that. I'm going to put that on my bio at some point. Female person in charge. Um, so yeah, I mean, there is there is like you know actual kind of aggression directed at women in the hobby still from trolls. Um, it's it's not as bad as it is in maybe other industries like video games, but it is still there. Um, but we are getting better at it. And like I was saying, the the big issue is kind of you know like I'm seeing a lot more women coming up to our booth and talking to us about our games. But there is still that kind of, like I still see it with, with other people, like if I go up to a booth, people ignore me because they don't assume that I'm interested in hearing about the games, right? Um, if a man and a woman come up to a booth, people will always talk to the man rather than the woman, right? You know, so there's a lot of that kind of, like I said, that kind of inconspicuous assumption that women are somehow not as interested in gaming or as involved in gaming or can't be gamers in their own right kind of misogyny. Can I ask you a question about that, Kat? Yeah. Compared to, say, the video game world where everyone's kind of um, these days online with each other, mm -hmm. do you think the kind of face-to-face -face participatory nature of your line of work, do you think that is part of why it's a little further along than maybe in the video games world? Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I mean, again, you know, like I was saying, it's a very small industry. Most people know each other. And the nature of role-playing as a hobby is that we all sit down together at a table with each yeah. other and we imagine other worlds we imagine better worlds with yeah. with each other or sometimes worse worlds you know for yeah. like <laughs> too fun um but yeah so i think that definitely it is like anonymity seems to me to be one of the big drivers for that kind of really vitriolic trollish behavior mm. on the internet and that's not just misogynistic trolling but it's it's trolling of all types right mm. you know for, a lot of creators on the internet that just from people um, with uh, their own stuff going on, I guess. Okay. Um, great questions and great answers. Another one, God, they're, they're, I'm, I'm being thrown heavy ones here, so we can kind of com combat the two of these. Uh, how do you combat the I want to give right up now moments and the how do you handle burnout, professional and personal? And Gav, mm. I'm going to start with you because you actually had... I've spoken at length about You have spoken at length about this, and I think that you'd be a good place to start. Yeah. I cannot relate to that. I want to give up moments. I've never in my life had one of those. Um, but the burnout is very, very real. I've had severe burnouts where I ended up in therapy because I wasn't looking after myself and I wasn't looking after the people around me. And all I cared about was work. And um, it's it's a very easy trap to fall into when your career depends on a YouTube algorithm and you know making things timely and making things fit and uh, it's I, I don't really know, have any advice on it other than to look after yourself and to make sure your priorities are in the right place I've learned over the last maybe three years to deal with it a lot better 
Um, but unfortunately, especially for people in my line of, of like where you're depending on YouTube, you, you are dependent on an algorithm and my numbers suffer when I make less work, but I would rather enjoy my life a little bit. So it's all about balancing your, and I, I really hope that the, the, not just YouTube, but maybe whatever other companies are in charge of this kind of content. Like you even see it with vloggers burning themselves out. I hope they can learn to prioritize quality over quantity more because, uh, you know, it's very easy to burn out and get really, really tired. And, and your creative juices are own, they're limited. You know, it's not a, it's not an endless well. It does, it does run dry sometimes. Yeah, I, I, would, I would definitely agree with um, everything that Gav said. I've also burnt out very, very badly um, a couple of times. Um, and I think, you know, like Steve mentioned earlier about like the Lego, right? I think some things that I have learned is that particularly when you're making your hobby, your job, right? It's a thing that you love. It's a thing that you're interested in. And it's a thing you're always thinking about in your head. So it's very easy to just get stuck in that thing in your head. And you need to have a separate, a completely separate. And hobby is, is you know, maybe too strong a word, but like, like the Lego, you need to have another thing that you can do. And in my experience, it's better if it's a physical thing, if it's something that tactile that you can be touching, that just takes your head out of that same headspace, right? For that that gets your mind away from, that gives you a, a proper break from thinking about the other stuff. Um, and also I think having a support network is, is a thing that I have really learned has, has been vital at keeping me up and up and moving. Um, you have to have people around you that you trust um, who can basically take you away from it all and cover you in a big emotional snuggle blanket, right? And and tell you it's all going to be okay. And, and also warn you when you're yeah. going too far. Yeah, to tell you when you're being a bit of a dick as well is important. Yes, yes. And that's, <laughs> that, is, that is the most important and, thing is to tell you when you're being an asshole. And yeah. learning to recognize yourself when you're slipping into those bad patterns and yeah. kind of knowing how to pull back out again. Sorry, phrasing. <laughs> yeah, no, absolutely. Yeah. Uh, I've just been given a flag that we are actually gone beyond the five minute warning. We're almost at two minutes to the hour. Uh, so the team is letting me know that we're kind of coming to the end. I, I, I tried to push them going, can we have a few more minutes? Uh, if there's any objections, do we want to take a few more questions or are we kind of yeah. go, you know what, I'm let's end to. it. It's Sunday. We're hungover. There's no yeah. rest. <laughs> um, okay. I'm just waiting for the yay or nay to be waved to me. A quick question while you wait, to yeah. Rob. Can you send me contact info so we can talk more about Discord cons? Uh, certainly, more than happy to. Okay. Yay, networking. Yeah. Which, yes. was one of the, which was one is actually is one of the questions pending. Mm -hmm. uh, so what you know what while we're waiting, let's take yeah. that question. Mm -hmm. Um. So the question is if um where's it go? Where's it go? Where's it go? If you're not a good networker. What would your advice be? Get good. Yeah, I, I know it's kind of, uh, it, it, I kind of agree on that. Find a way to do it. Yeah, I mean, there are different ways to network. Like, I mean, a lot of like, gaming contacts are made in pubs, and I hate pubs. It is completely shut down on them. Um, so, like, you know, at Gen Con, for example, there's like the Dan Jones Award, which is like you know, one of the big freelancer group thing. It's a great way to make contacts, and I, can't stand it because it's a very loud pub. I just, I just go outside the smoke here. I don't smoke, but it's a lot quieter. It's a lot cooler. I can actually have conversations there. Um, but you learn for for other opportunities to make connection with people. Um, I, yeah. I just, this is online as well. It's just a huge thing. Like you're being present on Twitter and... Yeah. That's exactly it. I mean, I think that a lot of people view networking as like a dirty word. They're like, oh, I'm not a networker. I'm not, you know, one of those people. There's a kind of a perception of networking being this like, you know, hey, how you doing? Like shake hands, you know, like let me tell you all about me kind of thing. And that's actually not what it's about. It's just about meeting people. It's just about, like Gar said, putting yourself out there, putting yourself in spaces where you will be in contact with other people, whether that's you know, in the smoking area at a con or on Twitter, on Facebook. And, yeah, and yeah. it's about 
it's about providing content when you do this. Uh, yeah. The glad handers with no content are the ones who give networking a bad name. But uh, if you learn fact A and you realize that somebody needs to know fact A, whether that's an introduction to another person or whatever, well, just make sure they get it. And uh, karma will work around and people will tell you things too. It's entirely possible to network without being skeezy and fake and annoying. Yeah. Um, yeah. As the famous what, what, wanting your work to succeed is not an inherently negative trait in a person. <laughs> exactly. As the least famous person here, the amount of networking that I fell into just by chatting to people at conventions and that's how I got to know and talk to Gav was through someone else at a convention and now I've got people like um, Jesse Cox for example uh, who's a pretty famous YouTuber and a rather lovely person uh, Laura Kate Dale Gav Dunn never mm -hmm. heard of Laura <laughs> Is that, Is and, that? <laughs> and it's just people that if you're just willing to even just, from my opinion, just having Twitter, despite how toxic it can be at times, but having a Twitter and even just replying to someone's comment with, oh, I liked what you made there, or that's kind of cool, or just love that bit of artwork. And even just that, your name starts appearing in places. And that, just those tiny things. Mm -hmm. And with gaming, uh, RPGs and tabletops, if you, if you, don't mind going where there's a lot of people and I know for some people that is a big issue yeah. and I think that's where one of the things this year especially has come handy with moving GaleCon and other conventions to digital you can socialize without being near a person and for some people that has made their lives so much happier yeah and that is something that is uh despite my um feelings about like the the artist audience relationship it is something i you do think about a lot and you do interact with fans if, if as much as you possibly can because you know it's it does really you know yourself as a fan of other people how much it makes your day if if someone you whose work you like it uh, interacts with you so yeah. yeah even if it's just a thanks for the comments you're kind yeah, of like exactly. oh they saw it they read it yeah, exactly. Yeah. Um, exactly. Just to stop like, for a moment, we've been given the nod by pretty much everyone on the committee that we can keep going as long as you like. Cool. Yeah. <laughs> as long as people are happy to keep chatting uh, and answering the questions. So I'll pull up another question, shall we? Uh, when I said unattracting there, one thing that I've sort of found is it's, it can be useful to have a particular shtick or field of knowledge, especially with freelance writing. That like you know, if I have like you know, I'm aware of you know, twenty different gamers, but the, you know, that one guy is a gamer, but is also an expert on like you know Mesopotamian religion. And I hear what someone is doing a Mesopotamian role playing game. I'll go, oh, dude, you should like you know try to put your name in for that. If you if people are aware of you just as beyond like you know, random writer or like random game fan, how a thing that you are known for, sort of a niche that could be a very useful thing to have. Mm -hmm. Uh, so the next question, and this is a much more lighthearted one. What's your funniest what the heck moment that's happened to you in, since you've in your career? Hmm. <laughs> Give everyone a moment to ponder that. Um, since, since we're talking about making one, one's hobby one's job, um, I, I started doing freelancing stuff, and then I got word that there was a, a staff writer job going among his publishing. And I applied for a corporate interview. So, so you know, I, I felt like, you know, this, this be like a, a, it's a real role-playing company. Like, you know, I don't know how, how sure how role-playing companies work, but I'm sure they've got like, you know, a big office or something. So I put on my suit, flew over to Swindon, got a uh, taxi to the address I was given, and it was a house. Okay, well, I'm sure it's like your know, boss's house. He's just like, you know, working from home today. Go up, knock on the door, in my like, you know, expensive interview suit. The little lady answers. Oh, hi, I'm looking for Matthew Strange, head of Mongoose Publishing. He's in his room. He'll be down in a moment. <laughs> we had the interview with the is it Matthew Strange's mother, like handy biscuits. They went. This is very casual from what I thought it would be. Mm. 
Okay, great. I, I've been given a hard target that we uh, to not let this run past ten in ten past. So we've got another six minutes. Mm -hmm. So thank you for letting us go over, team. I appreciate it. Let's see. Let's pull another foot. So anyone else have a funny one they want to share? Not really. It's when you work <laughs> alone. Struggling, uh, yeah. Yeah. I mean, back in the band days, I could tell you a few stories, but they wouldn't be appropriate for all audiences. <laughs> <laughs> okay, let's see. Yeah. Um, my my best convention stories are not suitable for any audiences. <laughs> <laughs> I've heard some of them. I disagree. <laughs> but that's probably for another con. <laughs> Let's see. I'm just waiting. People are um, ah, with the increase in digitization of everything, what has been the biggest change from where you started to where you are now? Desktop publishing. That's. I think it's a funny one for me because the internet was simultaneously what stopped me and my band from being signed to major labels and ruined our career. But then it also became what gave me the opportunity to make my own career as well. So it's it's an interesting one. Yeah, I mean, for me, like, you know, I got into like full time uh, game writing through freelancing. And to a large degree, that avenue is far, far smaller than it used to be because it's it's far more easy for like a you know, random person on the street to go, right, I will now make a game and get a distribution to drive through or Kickstarter or whatever. The, the barrier to entry is far, far lower. And if someone was starting up now saying like, you know, how do I turn my hobby into a job? I wouldn't say go to companies. I would say they publish your own stuff. And I, I agree. I love how the internet has cut out the middleman for, for artists. It's, yeah. it's fantastic. Why, we, we can now earn 100% of our Spotify royalties instead of 7%. You know, you don't yeah. need a record label anymore. <laughs> That's, I mean, that's absolutely the biggest kind of change for us as well. Like, like Steve said, you know, desktop publishing um, and also digital publishing. Like I remember a small company that I used to kind of volunteer for um, when they started out, like they had to borrow money extensively from a lot of different places to do a print run of RPG, like a big uh, RPG hardback book. And they had to print 3000 copies and then they had to store all those copies and like, and now it's just the barrier, I always say this, but like the barrier to entry has never been as low as it is right now for people getting into the hobby, just like Gar said, doing their own thing, just jumping in there and publishing their own game. Like it's, you know, the world of difference. And I think as well, you have to kind of give a shout out to crowdfunding platforms like Kickstarter and Patreon, um, because, you know, they've really made it possible for people to, you know, for people to get, financial support for people to get capital into their own creative business in a way that I don't think people really had access to before. My, I was talking about this with my wife the other day as well. And we were saying, why are most of the uh, really interesting pop stars of the last decade have been women? And I think that's because of the way the internet has democratized culture a little bit. And, you know, the men have to make more of an effort now. <laughs> we can't just coast <laughs> along and yeah. get everything handed to us, you know, because like yeah. all, I'm telling you, all of the artists I found in the last 10 years that I love musically, mo most of them are women. Like, And I think that is a huge sign of how the Internet is just letting people listen to what they want to listen to. There's no middleman telling you here, listen to this. This is what you like. You know, of course, there still is that in the white, the wider mainstream culture. But when it comes to uh, like mid-tier artists, I'm talking about now. Um. So with that, uh, any last words, anyone? Let's just go around the room it, clockwise for me. So Steve, you're first. I think. I think we're pretty well summed up. Actually, uh, I don't. I don't have anything brilliant to add. I. I think we delivered the message. Cat, mm -hmm. you're next. Um, I mean, I my message is always just do the thing, right? Just just go for it. Just do it. If you want to write, write. If you want to do art, you know, create art. Do the thing. Get it out there. You know, if you want to organize a thing, organize a thing. Do whatever it is you're passionate about. And if you do it long enough, you might actually manage to turn it into your job. But just do the thing for because it's a thing that you love. 
right? Don't do the thing with any sort of um, alternative kind of, well, what's that, that phrase that I'm blanking on? Um, don't, don't have any kind of intention um, for what you're doing. Just do it because you love it. I agree with Kat and I'd expand on it as well in saying and don't be afraid to fail and don't get discouraged if you do fail and it's very important to learn how to separate ego from your work and once you do that it's very freeing and uh, you you'll be able to fail and learn from it as opposed to failing and, and kind of giving up. Uh, Gar, any last words you'd like to add to that? If you're going to turn your hobby into your career it really helps to marry someone with a comfortable job. <laughs> yeah <laughs> yeah <laughs> also don't expect your first stuff to be good you know it's going to be really crap probably and that's perfectly okay and you, you'll gradually get better by doing it more and more and more well um thank you very much everyone for coming along and supporting gail Khan. thank you for having having me along with the chat and trying to wrangle you though i just kind of sat in the corner and um 